This video is about pentosin polysulfate, what may be the most powerful drug for the preservation of and the enhancement of joint integrity in both man and animal. Since pentosin polysulfate has never been co covered before on YouTube in a comprehensive manner, I performed my own extensive literature review on the subject and have uh, produced an article, a blog post on my blog where you can review my research directly yourself. The blog post is very concise and it is basically a review of various papers that uh, expand on how pentosin polysulfate may affect our health. I highly recommend you visit the blog post which is linked to in the description of this video below. But during the video, we're actually going to use my blog post as a guide for our discussion. I thought of trying this this time to make the video a little bit more visually appealing or easier to follow. So let's get started. So this is the text of my article. It's obviously not on the website yet. I'm recording this before I put it online. Pentosin polysulfate, by the way, its origin is from a natural source, the Vegas sylvatica plant. It is a semi-synthetic sulfated polysaccharide that was found originally in natural form. Now, talking about its metabolism, we're not going to get into pharmacokinetics in too much detail, but I wanted to point out something. So first of all, it has an average molecular weight that's similar to low molecular weight heparin. For those that don't know, heparins are drugs that are used to inhibit clotting and have been used extensively, for example, post-COVID. Now, there is an oral version of pentosin polysulfate. There's both a subcutaneous injection and actually in studies, they sometimes use an intramuscular injection. But there is an oral version and the brand name is l -Myron. Elmyron is FDA approved for the treatment of interstitial cystitis, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But what's interesting about the oral version is, as you can see, the oral bioavailability is less than 1%, with the majority of it being excreted unchanged in feces. And we'll see later why this could be an issue. When you have a drug that is mostly not absorbed orally, it usually can put, it, it can sometimes put undue stress on the liver or on the intestinal system. And this seems to happen with pentosin polysulfate when it's given orally. We'll see also later that when it's given orally, it tends to have less benefits for, um, for example, inflammation and so on. There is also an injectable version. The brand name is SP54. I believe it's a, of German origin. Now let's start with how pol uh, pentosin polysulfate sulfate, which I'll call from now on as much as I can PPS, let's find out how PPS may be uh, neuroprotective. So for example, in a model of basically a stroke followed by the treatment of the stroke, they call it ischemia reperfusion injury, PPS as well as low molecular weight heparin were found to be neuroprotective, likely through their effects on, uh, on the blood. Uh, PPS also has an anti-prion effect, which seems to be related to its interaction with heparin binding sites on the prion proteins. For those that don't know, prion disease is a kind of disease that people used to get from using a human growth hormone in the 80s and so on. In fact, there was a very famous football player who seems to have potentially developed a disease from that. I can't remember his name. If you guys do remember his name, let us know below. He has, he's a very famous guy. He was, used to work out in Venice Golds. Anyway, um, so next, PPS has been shown to reduce the size and number of beta amyloid plaque aggregates. Beta amyloid plaques are the one of the two main uh, 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 reasons for the disease of Alzheimer's. So the beta amyloid plaques and their development from amyloid precursor proteins are one of the main ideologies. The other one is what are called tau tangles, which are intracellular. So PPS treatment has been shown to reduce the development of plaque aggregates from beta amyloid and Alzheimer's disease models in rodents, as well as to protect their blood bra brain barrier integrity, which is something we lose as we age. Now briefly, I just wanted to mention PPS has some effects similar to heparin on blood, so that's something to consider, um, but much, much weaker than other uh, heparins. Now about the bladder ailment, so this is what PPS is actually FDA approved in the US to treat in humans. There's a bladder ailment called interstitial cystitis, which I mentioned earlier. As you can see here, it's a disease believed to be caused by a weak bladder epithelium, resulting in basically a uh, diffusion of urine across the bladder uh, and, and producing as a result an autoimmune reaction. So interestingly it's somewhat similar to other autoimmune diseases like uh, Crohn's or colitis in which uh, you know the bacteria in the uh, intestines somehow provoke the immune system to react because they're trying to uh, sort of eat their way through the mucosal protective layer of the intestine. Anyway there's some kind of 
um, result to the to the immune system. By the way, similar thing happens in arthritis also. Uh, chunks of cartilage get distributed around the joint and the immune system reacts to it also. Anyway, in this case of, of the disease called interstitial cystitis, which I'll call IC from now on, it is treated with oral PPS as an add-on therapy. Uh, interesting, I made a note here. Um, IV infusions of 6,000 milligram NAC per infusion in one case report actually resolved symptoms of this disease also. So it's, it seems that the disease has quite a lot to do with inflammation potentially. Anyway, I don't know that much about the disease, but the reason why I'm covering it here is just so that you guys know that is what PPS is actually used to treat in the US, but it is usually used orally. Next, shockingly, PPS has some protective effects on cardiovascular disease. So in this uh, Watanabe heritable hyperlipidemic model of ra rabbits, Basically, these are rabbits that have high cholesterol levels, high lipid levels. Um, fed, they were fed an atherogenic diet, which means a diet probably high in saturated fats. I can't recall this exact study, but usually the atherogenic diet is high in saturated fats, meaning it has more likelihood to increase their cholesterol levels and potentially increase the deposition of plaque in their uh, vascular system. So in this model, PPS, one month of oral PPS treatment, the, the paper actually said retards the progression of plaque development in the cardiovascular system. In another rodent model, uh, with heart pressure overload due to aortic banding, PPS is treatment near 80% near inhibition of the Agrican Adam TS4. So Adam TS4 has some beneficial impacts on uh, our health. So for example, in the brain, it's involved in myelination of oligodendrocytes, but it seems to play a causal role in the development of cardiomegaly, which means an increase in the heart size due to pressure overloads in the vascular system. That's something uh, a lot of athletes, for example, have to deal with because their hearts tend to grow and they also tend to have higher blood pressure when these athletes, strong men or powerlifters are much bigger. So cardiomegaly, cardiomegaly is a thing that happens among healthy athletes as well as athletes in particular that have higher blood pressure. So it can get much worse. So it's interesting to see that PPS somewhat inhibits that, uh, that development. But these are in animal models, of course. Nonetheless, it still has the mechanisms. Next, in the case of high glucose environments, which can be bad for the body. So for example, in this in vitro study of uh, high glucose treated renal cells, they found that PPS inhibited apoptosis and inflammation by blocking pro-inflammatory gene transcription, P338 activation, and blocking the synthesis of pro-inflammatory cytokines from the immune system. So there's a lot of aspects, we'll continue going through this, there's so many, that's why I called the drug a pleiotropic drug, because it has so many beneficial aspects, it seems, in different elements of, even in cancers, there's a mechanism. So PPS, it seems to inhibit the paracrine effects of heparin binding growth factors, which prol uh, proliferate endothelial cells and produce local angiogenesis. That's the development of new blood vessels, and they're released from tumor cells. So there's a mechanism we think that or not we, but authors think that PPS may inhibit uh, cancer development or have an anti-tumor effect. But actual phase one trials in humans have yet to show this effect. Nonetheless, there are not uh, controlled trials, but uh, case studies or, or much smaller trials that have shown, so for example, in this study, three patients with sarcomas had their disease progression halt until one to three months after PPS cessation, whereby the malignancies began to progress again. So there have been case reports of it slowing down um, the progression of cancers, but phase one trials, controlled trials were unable to show it. Now, interestingly, in these case studies where they gave uh, people with cancers PPS, um, they developed uh, rectal ulcers. And the reason why it seems they developed these rectal ulcers was because of one of two reasons. Either the inhibition of basic fibroblast growth factor, which is a growth factor that may be protective to the intestines uh, generally, or secondly, and by the way, if that first case is true, which it probably is true, then intermittent use of uh, PPS may, may be uh, sufficient to not cause so much inhibition of basic fibroblast growth factor that would cause these kind of rectal ulcers. Or two, and I think this may be the case as well, the lack of uh, good absorption of the drug means a lot of it goes through the intestines and may get deposited toward the end of the rectum, causing local inflammation. So as you can see here, there's a second study that seems to have confirmed the basic fibroblast growth factor's role in the structural changes to the intestines. Uh, in mice, it produced le lethal intestinal hemorrhages. So anyway, I, by the way, guys, I've never considered taking this orally personally, and I would never consider taking it orally. It's 1% it's absorption rate. It's not worth it. Uh, but the reason why they give that to other people is just for convenience sake. It's difficult to get people to inject themselves subcutaneously frequently. Um, 
That's most likely the only reason, I think. Now, moving to kidney disease. Various models of kidney disease show a protective effect from PPS. So I'm just going to take you on a quick tour of this. So diabetic nephropathy. Diabetes, by the way, causes kidney damage. So oral treatment in elderly rodents preserved kidney function, inhibited pro-inflammatory gene transcription, and reduced al albumin in the urine. It also prevent, it may prevent the recurrence of kidney stones by decreasing liver glycolate oxidase activity. By the way, I don't really know how this enzyme works exactly. But anyway, it also seems to, now this is another model of ischemia reperfusion, that's sort of the effect of a stroke and the treatment of a stroke, causing acute kidney injury. Long-term PPS treatments seem to have attenuated the acute kidney injury, reversing it over time in diabetic rodents, while in non-diabetic rodents, a single dose of PPS before the stroke and reperfusion seem to be protective for the kidneys. In patients with chronic kidney disease, which, uh, which is a common disease uh, among men in general in later life, three months of PPS treatment reduced the expression of pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines TNF-alpha and interleukin-18, and reduced protein in the urine, and improved the estimated glomular filtration rate, which is sort of an estimate of how much the kidneys are filtering over time. Uh, it also reduced cholesterol levels, which we see in a very, various studies. It's also protective in the 5-6 nephroctomy model by attenuating hypertension in the kidneys and suppressing inflammation. And it's also protective in um, models of sodium-induced hypertension. Uh, and there's the mechanism as well. PPS has interesting effects on the immune system. So as you can see here, in this, in, in this rodent model, oral PPS treatment increases splenic macrophage and natural killer cell activity stimulating the immune system and reducing incidence of melanoma tumors. So it improves immune function in one sense. It increases Im the immune system's ability to ki uh, kill, for example, tumor cells. But at the same time, it reduces Th2-dependent cytokines, which are drivers of an allergic inflammatory response. So, for example, like an allergic rhinitis. And the effect there seems to be stronger than heparin and almost similar to an anti-allergic effect uh, of topical nasal steroid treatment. So it actually reduces uh, sort of autoimmune or allergic reactions while improving immune system activity, sort of similar to low-dose naltrexone therapy, and that's quite rare. Now, I, I just wanted to go through basically all the models in which PPS has ever been used, even in animals. So I'm including a lot of things that may be not relevant to you guys. But the next thing we're talking about is benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is the development of a larger pro prostate as men age. It's also, um, it, it can cause a couple of problems. One problem is an issue with urination and with sexual activity. Another is that it can become malignant and produce uh, prostate cancers. So interestingly, it's been, PPS treatment has been shown to reduce the proliferation of smooth muscle cells and decrease extracellular, extracellular matrix deposition of collagen in the prostate. And those two things are hallmarks of what's called benign prostatic hyperplasia. I cover some rare diseases here which I probably shouldn't discuss on the video. Also, it has antiviral effects. PPS has a potent anti-HIV effect. Um, and it may be related to tyrosine kinase inhibition, which is, by the way, one of the uh, pathways that chemotherapeutic drugs work through. And it also has this kind of effect on human T-cell le leukemia virus type 1. And in fact, there are other viruses that it has uh, wonderful effects on, which we'll cover a little bit later. Now, let's talk about the mechanism. This, this is the meat of the matter. Let's talk about the mechanisms of how PPS improves um, joint integrity. So first of all, PPS inhibits the, the consequent effects of a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines that are released from the immune system. So for those that don't know, a lot of the damage that happens to our joints is not simply due to mechanical insult or wear and tear over time, but the result that the wear and tear or the mechanical insult have on our immune system, which then causes downstream action that degrades the joint further. So arthritis is like that, osteoarthritis is like that, and these are hallmarks of those diseases. So in this section, what I've done is outline for you guys how exactly PPS inhibits the activities of some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. I won't go into too much detail in the video because I fear that I may bore the audience, but as you can see, this is interleukin-1 beta-dependent effects, interleukin-1 alpha-dependent effects, and tumor necrosis factor alpha dependent effects. These are three of the main pro-inflammatory cytokines involved in the degradation of joints. And as you can see, what, what, is called, what PPS does is inhibit P38 and ERK, ERK sorry. It inhibits 
uh, NF-kappa-B, which is a pro-inflammatory uh, transcription pathway. It has direct effect on matrix metalloproteinases uh, and uh, what are called agrokinases. There they are. And it has also, interestingly, a direct effect on pro-NGF secretion and NGF mRNA. What's NGF? NGF is actually nerve growth factor. Some, one of the ways that um, researchers are trying to limit uh, the pain that people with chronic pain feel is by inhibiting nerve growth factor development. Interestingly, you can see here that tumor necrosis factor alpha causes an increase in nerve growth factor development, potentially one of the ways in which it sensitizes people to joint pain. So there's a lot of uh, wonderful effects that PPS has basically on joint inflammation, but it also increases the synthesis of collagen and the development of chondrocytes. Those are the cells that produce collagen, uh, or not the cell, the, the main cells of collagen. So, so let, we'll, we'll look at those in a second. So next, these are some viral models of arthritis. So this ch uh, chiku, chikungunya virus, and the alpha virus, the Ross River virus. Both of these viruses produce uh, symptoms that are very similar to arthritis, and both are uh, effectively treated with PPS. Um, and now we look at some animal models of arthritis. So for example, in rabbit, uh, rabbits, PPS pretreatment inhibits damage to the cartilage in the face, face of inflammatory insult. So it can protect people actively from a single acute event, as we saw with the kidney studies. Second, in this study on Mongolian horses, four weeks of uh, once weekly, so literally four injections of PPS over four weeks, altered the balance of anabolic to catabolic markers of ca cartilage metabolism in favor of anabolism. So the four injections were enough to uh, twist the scale in favor of anabolism of the development of joint cartilage. Um, this is an interesting study, just a survey of veterinarians. They found that 80% of vets used PPS as a prophylactic agent prior to competition of horses. Um, and 48% considered it to have a high efficacy in the prevention of osteoarthritis. So you can see in general that veterinarians are somewhat agreed that um, PPS is a very valuable PED for competition and uh, slightly less than the majority believe it can inhibit the development of osteoarthritis, meaning change the course of the disease, which is very different than dealing with symptoms. Um, also note that uh, the most common regimen was three milligrams per kg for four weeks, which means like 300 milligrams for an adult of once a week injection subcutaneously, for four weeks, followed by monthly injections once monthly. Um, in this study on dogs, you can see that PPS time and dose dependently encouraged proliferating chondrocytes, so the cells of, the, of, the, of, the, of our collagen, to remain in the G1 phase and less in the S and G2 phases of their cell cycles, sort of doing something like what minoxidil does for our hair. It also promotes the chondrocytes to develop into a chondrogenic phenotype. That means a, a phenotype that can produce more collagen. Um, and finally, uh, in an allogenous cartilage particle model of osteoarthritis, by the way, that's a very common model of osteoarthritis where they create osteoarthritis in animals, PPS was found to be, as I said earlier, disease modifying meaning that it attenuated the progression of the disease as opposed to only alleviating symptoms. There are very few drugs that do that for arthritis or for uh, joint issues. Now this section, I just uh, there's actually a lot of papers on this subject. I just uh, quoted a couple of them because I wanted to introduce the subject to you guys. Mesenchymal precursor cells are one of the ways in which uh, researchers are thinking to rehabilitate people's joints. The idea is to inject these cells directly in the joints, but the problem is you want these cells to differentiate and proliferate into the kind of cells that you want in the joints. Well, it seems that PPS, when, when co-administered with the mesenchymal precursor cells, can alter their proliferation and make them into chondrocytes and increase their chondrogenesis, which means basically making them the kind of cells you want to produce collagen and to be integral cells of that joint uh, tissue. Now, the next section is human trials. We may skip some of these because they're a little bit rarer, like Christopher Jacob disease, uh, diabetic neuropathy, and prion disease. But looking at the first two, an in vivo study on PPS, six once weekly subcutaneous two milligram per kg injections. So if you're a 100 kg person, that's 200 milligram subcutaneous injections once a week for six weeks. They greatly improved knee osteoarthritis parameters for up to a year. Six injections improved humans' knee quality for a year straight. That is incredible. 
In a second human uh, trial, and this is a randomized controlled trial, which is one of the highest levels of trials you can have, four weeks of once weekly injections of three milligram per kg, which means uh, that would be 300 milligram subcutaneous injection if you're a 100 kg person, improved knee function. So just four injections improved knee function for eight weeks following the cessation of treatment in people with osteoarthritis. So you can see a long lasting effect from infrequent and low doses. Now this drug sounds wonderful. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with it yet, but there is unfortunately. Extended use of the drug produces eye disease in people. A kind of eye disease that, as you can see here, is easily distinguished from hereditary eye disease like age-related macular degeneration, which, by the way, I'm very predisposed to. But the good thing is, and another thing I want to mention about this uh, eye disease is that it is progressive, meaning that even if the person stops using the drug, the disease is seen to progress for a while thereafter. It's not that well studied, but from what we know, it doesn't seem to stop at a certain date thereafter. The good thing is that this, I'll read, I'll read for you guys here, this unique pigmentary maculopathy presents on average after a cumulative exposure of 2,263 grams, not milligrams, over 186 months. So who is using the drug this much? The people with interstitial cystitis, that bladder issue. They usually are older people and they may be taking it for 15 to 20 years in a row. That's when you see the eye damage. So in, I just summarized this for you guys. It would require around 11,000 injections of 200 milligrams or 15.5 years of exposure to get to this point. So there may be some safety zone. Uh, in the sense that we can see that four injections improve joint quality in people for extended periods. So it may be such that, for example, say, um, depending on the purpose you're looking at, I mean, say you look at this for people with arthritis, maybe uh, intermittent use um, once every four months or six months may be useful to protect their joints. On the other hand, if you look at somebody who's, uh, for example, an athlete that's trying to build almost superhumanly strong joints and is using other PEDs that increase the synthesis of some of this uh, tissue as well, like growth hormone and so on. These athletes might decide, since athletes often put their health at risk for their performance, that maybe they want to use PPS for a year straight during a time period in which they, or not straight, but use it on and off for a year during a time period in which they are very in a very anabolic environment so that they can create tissue in their joints that can last degradation for a number of years thereafter and give them a true advantage. So maybe using it for one or two years may be worth it in the risk benefit ratio. That's what I'm, I'm postulating, but I'm not completely sure. The studies do not show people using it for a year or two years developing the maculopathies, but nonetheless, it may happen to someone who's unusually predisposed to it. So you may want to be careful and run the risks mentally before you decide to use this. Before I forget, interestingly, again, the, the block, blo blockade, why did I say blockage? The, the blockade of basic fibroblast growth factor could be the reason also here for the damage to the eyes. Remember, that's the same growth factor that we thought could be responsible for the rectal, um, rectal damage from taking the drug orally among those people that had the cancers. Now, in terms of protocols, so in general, the dosing seems to be ideal between um, two to three milligrams per kg for humans. The injections are always superior. So for example, the one in a canine model, daily oral dosing compared to every other week, subcutaneous injection revealed that subcutaneous injections better reduced inflammation in cerebrospinal fluid, which is the brain, brain tissue, and in the vascular structure, likely due to greater bioavailability. Also, I mentioned here that co-administration with heparins which uh, are anticoagulant drugs that are related to it may be safe in people. But so basically what's the long and short of it? The long and short of it is that using this drug at, if you're a 100 kg person, between 200 milligrams to 300 milligrams once weekly subcutaneous injections would be the maximal dose. And there would be a reason to consider not using it every week maybe building up uh, for a month and then using a maintenance schedule like veterinarians do, or maybe using it intermittently throughout the year, depending on whether you're trying to treat a disease or increase your performance for athletics. 
Anyway, guys, I hope this was interesting for you. I don't think there's ever been a video about pentosin polysulfate on YouTube, especially discussion of it as a PED. I have heard that some athletes in certain sports know about it and do use it as a PED, but it is very, very underused. So hopefully this will be open the subject up for discussion. And if you guys know of any athletes who've used it before and benefited from it, please let us know in the comment section below. Thank you guys so much for bearing with me and I'll see you next time.